Chapter 81 Hunting the Usurper You are listening at NovelFull.audio The battle between Marcellus and Constantine's forces turned into a slaughter. In reality, Marcellus was unaware of how much the usurper's forces had been drained during his failed bid to invade Hispania. Thus, he was vastly over. prepared for this so. called campaign. However, Marcellus did not expect that Constantine would send his army to their deaths, and used the resulting chaos to escape. As a matter of fact, the emperor was furious when he found out that Constantine had slipped from his grasp. Though he did not immediately know how the man had accomplished it, he had quickly sent word to all 50.4 thousand men in his army to scour the nearby mountains for any sign of the man. Currently Constantine was huddled under a rock cropping, as a century of Roman soldiers passed by above. He was so nervous that he had bitten his tongue in order to ensure his silence. As for Hagen and his men, they were hidden nearby, on the other side of the ravine, under their own cover. The Roman soldiers stopped as they came to the ledge and saw that there was a narrow path leading up the cliff's side. Though it was treacherous, it was entirely possible that the usurper had used it to escape. Thus, the centurion in charge of the unit quickly called out to one of his men and gave him an order. Ride off and inform the emperor that we may have found the route that the usurper used to escape. Request that he dispatch more forces to this area. If Constantine followed this route, he should not be far. The messenger quickly nodded his head and saluted his centurion before hopping on his horse and riding off towards where Marcellus was currently resting. As for the Constantine, he and his men did not move a muscle in fear that the slightest disturbance would reveal themselves. However, in the next moment Constantine gazed in horror as a scorpion crawled from the top of the cliff onto the helmet of one of his nearby soldiers. He tried to motion towards the man that there was a poisonous insect on top of his head, but the soldier merely looked at his emperor as if he had lost his mind. In the next moment, the bug crawled down onto his neck and stung the man, causing him to yelp and lose his footing. The soldier fell over the edge and down to his death, which the nearby Romans noticed. The centurion in charge quickly unsheathed his blade and cried out to his unit. They're hiding under the cliffs. Having been spotted, Hagen and his men rushed out from their position and engaged with the Roman soldiers before they could prepare a proper formation. The century of soldiers from Marcellus' army and the Frankish barbarians clashed against one another on the edges of the cliff above. A Frankish warrior wearing a bear's skin rushed toward the centurion, who responded by firmly kicking the man in the chest and pushing him over the edge. After killing that warrior, the centurion brought his spada to the nearest man's chest, shoving his blade deep into the Frank's heart. He quickly called out to his men to form ranks as he the Frankish warriors began to overwhelm the Roman numbers. Like the legions of the Principate, Marcellus' men formed an exceptional war machine when they worked together. However, they were lacking in individual combat. It was all too easy for the lifelong warriors of the Franks to overwhelm their enemies once they were out of formation. As a result, over a dozen Romans had fallen in the short time since the engagement began. Ultimately, the remaining Romans quickly fell into formation, forming a shield wall that surrounded Hagen and his men while pushing them closer and closer to the edge. The Frankish chieftain began to sweat profusely as he looked behind him to see that he and his men were about to be shoved off the mountainside to their deaths. However, he quickly realized that they were surrounded, and if they could not break through the Roman century, then they were as good as dead. It was at this moment that Constantine mustered his courage and led his few bodyguards out of the opposite ravine. Hagen was relieved when he saw this, however, he began to curse his very existence when he saw that Constantine and his men did not come to aid him, instead they had run off. Leaving the Franks to their fate. Seeing that he was about to be left behind, Hagen quickly called out in the loudest voice he could muster. Look at the usurper. He's behind you. The centurion instantly responded to this by looking behind him and catching Constantine red-handed. This ultimately forced the coward to fight, as he could not escape now that he had been spotted. Constantine cursed beneath his breath for Hagen's disloyalty and unsheathed his blade before charging at the Romans from behind. He only had about a dozen men with him, 
and thus the legionaries in the rearmost line quickly spun around to deal with Gallo, Romans while the rest of the soldiers continued to push Hagen and his Frankish warriors off the ledge. Those who were lucky fell to the blades of the Romans, their abdomens pierced by the length of the Noric steel spathas. Others had to fall down the edge of the mountain and into the ravine below. Splattering on the rocks like a flattened pancake. Dot one by one Constantine's men fell by his side until he was all alone, and surrounded by angry Romans, he quickly threw his sword to the side and surrendered, seeing no other option to escape with his life. I yield. The centurion sneered in disdain before backhanding Constantine so hard he fell unconscious. He spared no time to bind up the man with rope. All the while, Hagen and his men continued to be pressed to the edge. Bodies fell to the blades, and others were pushed off the ledge. Until finally, only Hagen remained. He refused to fall to his death and instead tossed his shield to the side, as a Roman legionary stuck his blade into the man's gut. Blood seeped from the man's mouth as he fell to his knees, gazing up at his killer with a fierce look of determination in his eyes. He was about to say something about the gods when he was interrupted by a stern kick into his open wound, sending him over the edge in disbelief. His fall felt like it lasted for minutes, despite it only taking seconds, however in those moments he saw something shocking. Whether it was reality, or simply the fever dream of a dying man. In his last moments Hagen witnessed the Valkyries descend from the cliff side, and fly towards him while reaching out for his hands. He could not help but muster the last bit of his strength to grab towards the Valkyries while speaking of his excitement in a very feeble voice. I can see them. The Valkyries. They're coming for me. Immediately after saying these words, he crashed against a rock and splattered onto its flat surface. The Frankish chieftain was well and truly dead. As for the Romans, they had gotten the man they came for and killed the rest just as they were ordered. By now Constantine had recovered consciousness only to find that he was not able to kill himself because the Romans had bound and gagged him. Marcellus arrived on the scene shortly after, along with an army of soldiers. When he witnessed the sight of the usurper struggling on the ground, and the slain men by his side, he grinned maliciously before calling out to the man who had caused him much grief over the past two years. I presume you must be Constantine. Though this is our first time meeting in person, it is by no means our first encounter, wouldn't you say? Do not worry, I won't have you lashed to a cross just yet. I have other plans in mind for you. Men secure the usurper. You have done well. As for you, centurion, I believe a reward is in order. Consider yourself promoted to tribune. The centurion, who had overseen the capture of a usurper, and the elimination of his army's remnants, was overjoyed upon hearing this and immediately saluted his emperor before speaking the common battle cry his soldiers yelled. Ave, true to Augustus. Marcellus was pleased. Now that Constantine was taken care of, he had matters to attend to in Hispania before returning home. Though Tacius had sworn loyalty to him in order to gain Rome's support in removing Constantine as a threat, Marcellus was unsure if the man would keep his word and reincorporate the region into the empire. Thus, despite the victory achieved on this day, Marcellus still needed to descend into Hispania and deal with the Theodosian loyalists once and for all. Whether that was through brutal conquest or skilled diplomacy, that remained to be seen. However, with Constantine's capture, Gaul and Britannia had fallen back into Western Rome's control. Or at least in name. It would still take some time to dispatch legions into those lands to secure them until a local force could be raised. Chapter 82 Restoring an Empire You are listening at NovelFull.audio The battle was over, and the usurper was captured. Now within the custody of Marcellus, Constantine found himself well guarded and protected. He was a valuable prize, one that Marcellus planned to march through the streets of Ravenna, much like how Aurelian had done to the Queen Zenobia after he had defeated her, and her breakaway empire. As for the control of Gaul and Britannia, Marcellus immediately dispatched four legions to secure the regions. With Constantine's forces annihilated, a few garrisons would mostly protect the area. 
leaving them open to Germanic conquest, something that Marcellus did not plan to let happen. Four legions, two for Gaul and two for Britannia, would depart from their army under the command of Ordius, who would secure Gaul for his emperor, until a proper commander could be placed in charge of the region. As for Britannia, it was to be led by Primus. In the current state of affairs, Western Rome had turned into a military dictatorship where the different provinces were led by military governors. As for Marcellus, he would lead the remainder of his troops down the Pyrenees and into Hispania, where he planned to meet with Tacius and negotiate the region's reincorporation into the empire. Thus, after saying his farewells to his generals, Marcellus did just that. Tacius was not far behind Constantine and his army when the battle took place, and in reality, he had posted his soldiers at the bottom of the foothills when he realized that the battle was over. The message was clear. Marcellus would not advance into Hispania without his permission. Upon seeing this, Marcellus knew their alliance had come to an end, and either a new one would have to be negotiated, or one army would have to be defeated. Naturally, Marcellus had the upper hand, as his army was larger, better equipped, and better trained. However, such a battle would be a costly affair, and would diminish his overall military strength, which he needed to deter the Eastern Roman Empire from attacking him. With this in mind, he decided to at least attempt a peaceful negotiation. The two men met up in between their armies, guarded by their own elite troops. Tacius gazed upon Marcellus with a hint of disdain in his brown eyes. He knew who Marcellus was, and how he ruled. Marcellus was a military dictator, a despot who had overthrown the rightful emperor, and now commanded his territory through the might of his legions. Under an all-dot-powerful and brutal dictator, Rome had no chance to flourish. Or so Tacius thought. Thus, he did not bow to Marcellus and instead uttered his contempt for the man. So the despot of Ravenna who rules with an iron fist has finally entered my people's lands. To what purpose do I owe the displeasure? Marcellus sneered at the man, it was clear that neither of them had very much respect for one another, thus the emperor spoke with venom as he addressed the man's question. A lowly bootlicker dares to question my benevolence. Truly amusing. I'll have you know I have come to Hispania to reign corporate it into the empire. With the capture of Constantine, and the demise of his army, Gaul and Britannia now fall under my control. I am here to ensure that the last piece of the puzzle comes together. Tacius scoffed when he heard Marcellus demand. He did not very much care for the man. He decided to make his demands then and there. You will hand over the girl Placidia, so we can ensure her safekeeping until she can be safely shipped to her family in Constantinople. You will recognize Hispania as a part of the Eastern Roman Empire. For this, I will allow you to continue your facade of being an emperor in Ravenna. Marcellus immediately broke out into laughter when he heard these words. He could hardly believe what he just listened to. Was this man daft? What kind of ego was this? How could he possibly make demands of Marcellus with such a paltry force behind him? Marcellus instantly pointed back towards his army and scolded the man for his arrogance. You see that? That is an army of 30,000 legionaries under my command who will not hesitate to cut you and your pathetic army into pieces should I give the order. I suggest you realize the position you are in. Hispania is a part of the West, as decreed by Constantine the Great. You have no right to depart from my rule and swear fealty to the boy emperor and his cunt of a mother. I suggest you recognize the position you are in, and spare the lives of your soldiers. Because I will not give up Hispania. You will kneel before me and recognize me as your emperor, or you will die fighting for a dead man. It is your choice. Tacius spat on the ground in disgust and spoke the words most prominent in his mind. I will not bow before a despot, we will fight you until the E. Before he could finish his sentence, a member of his host unsheathed his blade and stuck it through the back of the man's neck, killing him on the spot. He died with shock in his eyes, and a sense of hatred for Marcellus. The killer kneeled before Marcellus and stuck his bloody blade into the ground as he lowered his head in submission. The legions of Hispania kneel before you, Emperor Marcellus. 
Marcellus wiped the blood from his face as he gazed upon the soldiers with amusement. One by one, they all kneeled before him. Whether it was fear that compelled them to submit, or admiration Marcellus did not know. Perhaps gazing upon the army he had mustered sent those who were more interested in military matters than politics to turn against their master. After all, what Marcellus represented was a military strength that the West had not seen in some time. There was also another possibility, and that was the soldiers beneath Tacius' command thought his demands were equally unreasonable as Marcellus. Either way, with the old fool out of the way, Hispania was now in Marcellus' grasp, and thus the Western Roman Empire was restored. Marcellus gazed upon his new troops and issued a speech unto them with a passionate glare in his olive-green eyes. The Western Roman Empire is now unified. I know many of you have questions about my leadership, but I promise you, should you follow my orders and defend the lands of the empire, I will restore to you all a world which we have lost as Romans. Tacius was a fool, incapable of seeing the necessity of my rule. I vow that I shall reign as the supreme authority in the West until a time where such centralized control is no longer necessary. Like Lucius Quinctius Cincinnatus before me, I am fully willing to give up the power I currently have, once I have ensured this crisis that befalls our lands pass us by, and the empire is stable, peaceful, and prosperous once more. Though the West is reunified after years of conflict, there are still many barbarians who trespass on our lands and wreak havoc across the realm. Take up the sword for me, and I promise to drive the Germans, the Huns, and any other barbarian group who threatens our empire from our lands. After I have done that, and secured the West for future generations, I will march on the East, and force them to unify with the West once more. Stay with me, and I promise you all, a brilliant future for not only your children, or your grandchildren, but your great-grandchildren and all their descendants. I fight not for myself, or my future offspring, but for all of Rome. Now rise, sons of Rome, and reclaim your destiny. After hearing this speech, the tens of thousands of soldiers, both from Hispania, and Marcellus' own forces, rose from their knees and unsheathed their blades shouting battle cries into the air. Marcellus' speech had convinced a fair deal of those who were hesitant to follow him, that he was the right man to rule over Rome during this time of crisis. Dot though they were not yet aware of the transformation that was occurring in Italia, his words fired them up. Each man standing in the foothills of the mountains was willing to fight and die for this dream to become a reality. For too long, Rome had been declining without any hope in sight. Yet in this time of darkness, a light had shone through, and won over the hearts and minds of every man present. With Tacius' death, Marcellus would have a hard time finding a replacement for him, that could rule the region in his stead. But that was a problem for another day. Now he just wanted to celebrate his victory, and the reunification of the Western Roman Empire. Chapter 83 Titus Claudius Marcellus Must Die You are listening at NovelFull.audio Yazdegerd stared at the report in his hands, which trembled with rage. He could hardly believe what he was reading. Previously, he had an agreement with Tacius that would see Placidia safely withdrawn from Ravenna and return to her family. As far as the Eastern Roman Empire was concerned, the upcoming marriage between the girl and her fiancé, Titus Claudius Marcellus, was one of coercion and was thus illegitimate. Aside from safekeeping Placidia, Hispania was supposed to join the East. It was planned to be the staging point for the Eastern Roman army for their attack on Marcellus. None of these things had gone as planned, Tacius was dead, and his soldiers had declared Marcellus emperor. Marcellus was still in the act of returning to Ravenna, but Yazdegerd's spies had already sailed from Hispania to Constantinople to give him notice of what had transpired in the foothills of the Pyrenees. Constantine was captured by Marcellus, and what fate awaited him when they arrived in Ravenna was unknown. One thing was certain, the Western Roman Empire had been fully restored, and under Marcellus' rule, no less. This did not bode well for Yazdegerd, or his young charge, Theodosius II. It was clear by Marcellus' actions that he intended to fortify his position, strengthen his control, and revitalize his economy. Edi Edi however, what came next? 
was the man truly content ruling over the West alone? Though Yazdegerd was unaware of the entire contents of the speech that was given, his spies seemed to report that he planned to head east in the near future. While Yazdegerd was confident that he had the means to defend himself from the West, it was disturbing that the Western army had recovered slightly. Though it only had nine legions at its command, and a bunch of Gothic barbarians. It would not be long before Marcellus restored all the old legions. A few years at best and he would have twenty-odd some legions at his command. Now that would be a threat to his rule. With this in mind, Yazdegerd had made contact with the various patricians in the west who were upset with Marcellus' rule. Naturally, with his rise to power, Marcellus had upset many prominent figures. After all, he followed no laws or traditions, and enacted new policies as he saw fit. In the eyes of many such actions were unbecoming of an emperor and was more like those of a tyrant. Yazdegerd forced himself to calm down, before turning around and gazing at the western patricians with a smile on his rugged face. He had treated these guests of his with the utmost courtesy as they dined upon the greatest delicacies from both eastern Rome and the Sassanid Empire. Evidently they were satisfied as the men gathered all had wide smiles on their faces. Thus, Yazdegerd chose the opportune moment to coerce them into becoming his pawns. Titus Claudius Marcellus must die. His reign of terror must come to an end if the Western Roman Empire has any hope of survival. He has abolished the Senate and butchered its members. He has appropriated your lands for his uses, and he places his military officers in political positions that by right should be yours. Sure, the man spins a pleasant tale for the common people to buy into. Follow me, and I will restore Rome to its former glory. Yet, he has spit in the face of every Roman law and tradition that dates back centuries. I heard he even erected the old altar of victory in the Senate building. He is clearly a godless heathen. As good Christian men, it is your duty to eliminate this threat to your way of life. The various men gathered all, lifted their glasses and cheered for the regent, who currently ruled over the Eastern Roman Empire. I agree, the man is nothing more than a military dictator, he must be eliminated. Death to tyrants. The Senate must be restored. Unholy heathens must be purged. Only God is the truth and the light. Yazdegerd grinned sadistically when he heard these men were so eager to kill Marcellus. Thus, he would use them, and their vast networks of contacts, to get rid of the thorn in his side once and for all. With Marcellus' death, he could place his charge, Theodosius, as the emperor of the west and east, uniting the two halves of the empire once more, with him as its regent. Of course, he would not tell the men gathered that was his goal. Thus, he made the entire meeting about deposing a tyrant. He had to admit, Marcellus had done him a huge favor. By stabilizing the realm and taking out Constantine, Marcellus had ensured that he could inherit the entire Western Roman Empire with few internal troubles. There was just one little obstacle he had to get rid of, and that was Marcellus himself. It was with this in mind that he stoked the fury of the Western patricians while their emperor was returning from war. I have gathered you all here today, because you are men of prominence in the West. I need each one of you to come together and help Met get rid of the man. We will make use of my contacts, and yours, to assassinate the man in the streets when he returns from his campaign in Hispania. In the middle of his little victory parade, an assassin of your choosing will shoot a poison arrow into his body. From the moment it breaks his skin, he will be a dead man. The sycophantic patricians clapped like trained seals as they heard this suggestion. It was best to maintain plausible deniability in a situation like this. However, one man in particular sat in the back of the room and observed the conversation with keen insight. Though he was a patrician who had lost a family member to Marcellus' purge of the Senate, and whose family's influence had declined as a result of Marcellus' policies, he was a man who was actually secretly supporting Marcellus. He was from Antarii and had infiltrated the ranks of the conspirators who hid in the shadows. The man's name was Octavianus Adinius Velius, and though initially he was against Marcellus' rise to power, he quickly changed his tune when he saw the extent that the man had accomplished in such little time. 
In times past, the Roman Republic would elect a dictator during a time of crisis. This man would assume full authority and save the Republic from its imminent demise. In the end, he would give up his power and return to his status as a normal citizen. Obviously, the days of the Republic were long past, and the last dictator who was elected was named Julius Caesar, who refused to give up his power. However, after decades of decline and internal strife, Velius was now convinced that a dictator was needed to save the empire from its collapse. Especially after witnessing what could be achieved when a benevolent man assumed such a position. Although Marcellus had risen to his position through violent rebellion, he was left with no choice, and ultimately never desired to be emperor in the first place. It was because of this that Velius was convinced that Marcellus would ultimately give up his power when he was no longer needed. Unbeknownst to Yazdegerd I, he had invited one of Marcellus' spies into his mix, and he took note of every suggestion that was put forward to eliminate the man. However, he made sure not to catch any unwanted attention, and continued to nod his head and voice his agreement with the rest of the conspirators. Thus, even Yazdegerd's keen eyes could not spot the rat among them. Yazdegerd I had a vicious smirk on his face as he continued to win over the favor of the conspirators with vile language directed at Marcellus. Though I wish I could capture the man alive and have him tortured on end for months. Unfortunately, killing a dictator and capturing one alive are two completely different things. It is likely that our little assassin isn't going to survive to see his payment. I wouldn't mind personally digging my blade into the man's flesh. Alas, I will have to settle for knowing he is dead, and can no longer threaten our empire. Yazdegerd used the words, our empire, despite being from the Sassanid Empire. This was another way he could get the conspirators to feel like he was on their side, and they ate it up. They had no idea that if their assassination attempt failed, he would use these men as a scapegoat. Velius could hardly prevent himself from sighing at the idiocy of the men surrounding him. If these were the type of men who held power in Rome, then it was no wonder why it had declined to such a state. They were utter fools, blinded by greed and avarice. Only Velius could see what kind of serpent Yazdegerd was, and he made sure to keep his interactions with him to a minimum during the duration of his stay in Constantinople. Velius would dispatch word later that night to Sigefrida about what was discussed in this meeting. Chapter 84 Striking First You are listening at NovelFull.audio Sigefrida looked at the note in her hand with a concerned gaze on her pretty face. She had received word from her fermentarii embedded in the ranks of the conspirators that they were plotting alongside Yazdegerd I to assassinate Marcellus. The plan was simple. Marcellus would undoubtedly be parading Constantine through the streets when he returned from his campaign. When that happened, the conspirators planned to use an assassin to eliminate him with a poisoned arrow. This was an insidious plan, but more importantly, it would be exceptionally difficult to prevent. For starters, it was impossible to know who this assassin was without an identity being revealed by the fermentarii prior to the assassination attempt. Her agents would have to voluntarily expose themselves if they wanted to get this information in time to prevent the attack. This simply wasn't an option. Sigefrida had spent great effort infiltrating the conspirators and would not reveal her hand so soon. The other option she had was to beef up security for the event. However, this would again prove difficult, as an average Roman composite bow had an effective range of 230 meters. The assassin could take up a position at any point overlooking the parade and strike without alerting the guards. By the time the poison entered Marcellus' bloodstream, it would be too late to save him. The swaby beauty bit her nails in anxiety as she struggled to come up with a solution to this problem. As she did so, the door to her room opened to reveal one Gala Placidia. The young woman gazed at Sigefrida with a hint of envy in her eyes. She knew that the barbarian woman was sleeping with her fiancé, but she could not bring herself to request that the man put a stop to such activities. Thus, the young woman had decided to confront Marcellus' concubine while he was away at war. Sigefrida immediately noticed Placidia's arrival and sighed heavily before speaking to her. To what do I owe the pleasure? Placidia glared at Sigefrida before walking up to her and getting in her face. 
Compared to Sige Frida, who was a tall and busty barbarian woman, the not yet fully developed Roman girl was considerably smaller, so much so that Sige Frida found it laughable that she was trying to be intimidating. Yet she did not reveal this, and instead gazed sternly at Placidia as the girl made her demands. I want you to stay away from Marcellus from now on. Don't think that I don't know what you two get up to at night, and I must say as his fiancée I do not approve. I have watched that man pine after you for years, and yet he has chosen me to be his bride. Thus, I will not allow you to steal him away from me now that he is finally in my grasp. Sigefrida gazed at Placidia with a look of pity in her eyes, though she wanted to tell the girl the only reason Marcellus was marrying her was because of politics, she stayed her tongue, after all she had far more important matters to attend to, things that were much more dire than the petty jealousy of a teenage girl. Sigefrida merely sighed as she expressed these exact thoughts to Placidia in an attempt to shoo her away. Placidia, as much as I respect you, I have to say I don't have time for your shit right now. There are important matters of state I must attend to, and you are wasting my time. So could you please leave me alone at my work? No matter how much you kick and scream, I am not leaving Marcella's side. The two of us have been in love since we were children. As much as it pains me to say this, now that Aliana is gone, the two of us can finally be together, and a little girl like you isn't going to change that. Placidia could only curl her fists in rage, as she wanted to scream at Sige Frida at the top of her lungs. However, she remained calm. After all, she would be the empress soon, and she needed to maintain her dignity. All she did was give a hateful gaze to Sige Frida as she backed out of the room and left behind some cryptic words. We will see about that. With this, the girl disappeared from Sige Frida's sight, no doubt to go off and scream into her pillow about how unfair life was. What would she know about fairness? The girl was born with a golden spoon in her mouth as the younger sister to the previous emperor. If Marcellus did not need the girl as his wife, Sige Frida would have been far more harsh with her treatment. While Placidia may have been watching Marcellus pursue Sige Frida all these years, Sige Frida had watched Placidia pursue Marcellus. Naturally, she knew of the girl's envy, but had never dared to bring it up. However, Sige Frida had more important things to attend to and immediately sought after the leader of her frumentarii, a man by the name of Falconius. The man quickly responded to the summons and entered Sige Frida's quarters, where he stood at attention. Since Sige Frida could not protect Marcellus from Eudoxia's assassins, she decided to take an offensive position where she quickly inquired about the feasibility of her plan. Falconius, answer me this to what extent are your frumentarii's assassination capabilities? This question startled the man, but he quickly answered it with a firm resolve in his eyes. I'd say our assassins are well trained. Why do you ask? Sige Frida stared sternly at the man before asking another question. How would you say they fare compared to freelance assassins? Or those of our rivals? Falconius thought about it for a while before coming up with a proper estimation of their strength. I would say they are better than freelancers, and slightly below the agents of the East. However, my question remains, why do you ask? Is there something you need me to do? Sige Frida smiled and nodded her head as she handed the report she had received from Velius over to the man. She gave a brief summary of its content before stating her response to these actions taken by her rivals. Our enemies in the East have decided to plot with our conspiring patricians to assassinate our emperor when he returns from his campaign to eliminate the usurper. Since I cannot find out the identity of the assassin, they will be choosing to undertake the task, nor can I adequately protect the emperor from such a threat, I have decided to strike first. I want every man and woman who has dipped their hands into the art of assassination to be silently taken out behind the scenes. If we kill enough assassins, it will act as a proper deterrence for any freelancer who even thinks of taking this job, forcing Yazdegerdai to use one of her own assassins for the job. This will make it much easier to identify and apprehend them before they can commit the attack. As for the Eastern Roman Empire, eliminate one of their generals as retaliation for this dastardly plot. 
I want them to know the price they have to pay for conspiring against Marcellus. For every attempt they make on my man's life, I will ensure they lose a general. If they still desire to assassinate Marcellus, the East will soon find itself completely without military leadership. What do you think of my plan? Is it feasible? Falconius thought about this prospect for several seconds, before giving an answer to the woman's question. Only a woman could be so black-hearted towards her enemies. All right, I will give the orders to my men. I will make sure that every freelance assassin in the Western Roman Empire is silently taken care. As for the general you wish to eliminate, do you have a candidate in mind? Sigefrida wore a sinister sneer on her pretty pink lips as she condemned a man to death by simply uttering his name. Aulus Pontidius Frugi, Falconius was startled by this news. The woman wanted to take out the Magister Militum of the East. This was not a simple task to accomplish, but if done successfully, would cause serious damage to the ranks of the Eastern Roman army. After thinking about it for a moment, the man bowed his head before responding in affirmation to his orders. I will see it done, upon hearing this, Sigefrida nodded her head before shifting her gaze out the window and into the moonlit sky above. A single phrase escaped her lips as she responded to the man's claim. See to it that you do, with this said Falconius was dismissed, and begun to give out Sigefrida's orders to the agents of the Fermentarii. A bloodbath would soon occur as assassins mysteriously vanished from the borders of the Western Roman Empire. Unknowingly, while Marcellus was away at war, the love of his life had condemned hundreds if not thousands of men to their fates. Had he known she was capable of such cruelty, he would be shocked. Chapter 85 A Botched Assassination Attempt You are listening at NovelFull.audio Marcellus gazed upon the city walls of Ravenna and smiled. Months had passed since he had first set out on his campaign to reunite the Western Roman Empire, and finally, he could return home as a triumphant hero. He was entirely unaware of the plots against his life and thus rode atop his steed proudly through the city. Alongside Marcellus were the 6,000 soldiers of his first legion. Though he had embarked on the campaign with nine legions of soldiers, he had returned with one. Why was this? It was because he had sent the other eight legions to the various regions of the Western Roman Empire to act as the main force in their defense. Two legions were sent to the four dioceses that contained the regions of Britannia, Gaul, and Hispania. Though the local troops of Hispania had sworn their allegiance to Marcellus, he needed his own forces present in the region to ensure their loyalty, and to continue their training so that they could become a proper force to be reckoned with. He would not stop until he had resurrected all 30.3 of Rome's ancient legions. Perhaps he would one day mount an expedition to Germania in search of the lost eagle that was never recovered. As for the other dioceses, such as Italy, Pananirum, and Africi, they were currently under the protection of a mixture of Roman legionaries and barbarian federati. Marcellus still intended to make use of the Goths, as per their treaty, and had thus dispatched large numbers of them to North Africa and Italia. Ceres commanded the troops in Italia, while Alaric led the forces in Pananirum. As for the Federati in North Africa, they were under the orders of Alaric's brother. In. Law, Athulf. Thus, for the time being, the Western Roman Empire had sufficient forces in place to protect its borders. Though much warfare would have to be waged in Gaul to drive the Franks, Vandals, and Swaby from the lands. Something Marcellus had faith that Ordius could accomplish. Marcellus rode through the city's gates at the front of his legion's formation. In one of his hands was the rope that was tied to Constantine's hand bindings, which dragged him through the streets. The man had been stripped naked and was propelled forward by the sting of a whip. Marcellus smiled and waved with his free hand as he brought forth his prize through the streets of his capital. The citizens of Ravenna cheered for the triumphant return of their emperor and jeered at the usurper, who was now bound and whipped through the city streets. Marcellus was entirely unaware that on a rooftop above a man was dipping an arrow in poison, before stringing it to his bow. Despite Sigefrida's purge of assassins, a man had made his way through the net of her security. This man was a member of Yazdegerd's personal assassins. 
the regent of the Eastern Roman Empire had been forced to employ his own agents in order to take out his rival. After what Sige Frida had done to Western Rome's freelancers, nobody in their right mind was willing to take the job that Yazdegerd had devised. This assassin prepared his shot by pulling back on the bowstring and aiming towards Marcellus' exposed flesh. After all, he doubted his arrow could pierce through the thick scale armor that the Western Roman Emperor wore. Just when he was about to lose the arrow and end Marcellus' life, the door to the roof he was standing on burst open, and startled him, causing him to launch the arrow and miss his target. Instead of killing the Western Roman Emperor, the assassin had struck Marcellus's prize, piercing through the heart of Constantine as the man struggled to believe his fate. Marcellus immediately reacted to this sudden occurrence by dismounting from his horse and finding himself under the protection of his legionaries, who raised their shields in a testudo formation. When the assassin realized he had failed in his task he cursed before switching his gaze over at the men who stood in the doorway with swords in hand. They were agents of Fermentarii who had successfully identified the would.be an assassin, and not a moment too late. Before the assassin could speak his words, he was surrounded and apprehended by the Fermentarii, who made sure to gag him so that he could not bite his tongue and end his miserable life. Falconius was the man who led this arrest as he gazed upon the Eastern Roman assassin with disdain before stating the man's identity with a proud expression on his face. TSK TSK TSK, I'm not going to lie. We had a hard time finding out who that bitch would send to kill the emperor. However, imagine my surprise when I learned the infamous Septimus Martius Rullus was the man chosen for the task. Don't worry, we will make sure you are given a quick death. That is, after we have learned everything we can from you. The assassin known as Rullus screamed through his gag, but his voice was muffled. He wanted to curse these men to death, but he could not say a word. Instead, Falconius gave him a quick kick to the head before grinding the man's skull beneath his shoes. Shut the fuck up. After saying this, Falconius pointed to his fermentarii and gave them further orders. Take this man to the dungeons. I wish to personally interrogate him as soon as the emperor has been informed about the current situation. The Fermentarii saluted their commander before carrying out their instructions. As for Marcellus, he was carefully led through the streets and into the palace, completely surrounded by a shield wall of his soldiers. Once he was safe and sound inside his home, he gave his orders to the men. Find out who is responsible for this and bring me his head. However, before the soldiers could run off and conduct these orders, Sige Frida appeared with a calm expression on her face. That won't be necessary. We have already identified and apprehended the would.be assassin. It appears your enemies in the east want you dead, your majesty. Yazdegerdai has conspired with your patricians in an attempt to end your life, and assert his charges claim over your throne. I assure you that our agent, who is hiding among the conspirators' ranks, will deal with them shortly. After saying this, Sige Frida dismissed the soldiers. She remained as cold as ice until she was alone together with the man she loved. The moment this occurred, she dropped her stoic facade and rushed over to Marcellus' arms, hugging him tightly while whispering her concerns into his ears. I was so worried. Even though I made ample preparations for this moment, the assassin remained undiscovered until the last moment. If the Fermentarii had been a second later in their arrest, you would be dead. Marcellus was stunned that Sige Frida had known about this assassination attempt for some time, and did not warn him in advance. He quickly questioned her reasoning for this. Why didn't you warn me, if you knew about this? I could have died. Sige Frida bit her lip in frustration before revealing her reasoning for taking such an enormous risk. If we had alerted you, the assassin would have aborted the operation and made another attempt at another date. By using you as bait, we could take him alive. This way we can gain much information about Yazdegerd and his spy network. We just need to be thorough in the interrogation. Such a response seemed logical enough, though it unnerved Marcellus to see just how well Sige Frida had settled into her position as his spymaster. If it was before, he did not believe she would so easily risk his life to apprehend an assassin. 
now, she seemed to take the big picture into consideration instead of her feelings. Marcellus himself did not know how to feel about this change of character. Before he could inquire further about this, Placidia ran into the hall and hugged him tightly. She was entirely unaware of what had just happened in the streets, and was more concerned about her fiancé's return. You're finally home, Marcellus. I missed you so much. It was only after gazing upon the uneasy expressions on Marcellus and Sigefrida's faces did Placidia suspect something was wrong. What happened? Why do you both look so glum? Marcellus sighed and wore a bitter smile before patting the young girl's head. He shook his head before denying that anything had happened. After all, he did not want to cause his fiancée to worry about such dreadful matters. Nothing Placidia, I was just discussing something of ill importance with Sigefrida. Come, let's get something to eat. I'm dying for some Alfredo. Placidia smiled and dragged Marcellus off to the dining table before giving Sigefrida an order with a sly expression on her face. I'm sure Sigefrida would be happy to make us a meal, won't you? Sigefrida gazed upon Placidia with contempt in her eyes, before sighing and nodding her head in defeat. That, certainly, thus Marcellus went off to have a meal with Placidia, completely ignoring the assassination attempt that was just made in his life. After all, there was not much for him to do now that the would.be assassin was in the custody of his fermentarii. All he could do was wait until the information he desired had been pried from the man's lips. Chapter 86 Starting a New Tradition You are listening at NovelFull.audio Unlike the Eastern Roman Empire, who failed to assassinate Marcellus, the Western Roman Empire was more covert in their actions. Currently, Sigefrida met with a bunch of female slaves. These women came from various regions of the Western Roman Empire and, like herself, were sold into slavery at a young age. She had a stern expression on her face as she pulled out a small key from her bosom and began to unlock the collars on the women's necks one by one. I am freeing each of you from the bondage that you have endured since your youth for a single purpose. It has come to my attention that our enemies in the East have a weak spot for beautiful foreign women. I intend to take advantage of this. With your freedom comes a condition that you will serve in the frumentarii for five years. Afterward you will be eligible for retirement, and given a proper wage through your tenure as an agent. I expect each and every one of you to fulfill your orders to the letter. Once you have completed the terms of our little arrangement, I will release you, and you will be free to travel the empire as free women, or you can return to your homelands assuming they still exist. Are there any questions? A beautiful vandal woman by the name of Gatifreda raised her hand meekly as she asked the question on her mind. What is the Frumentarii? Sigefrida had forgotten that the existence of the organization was a secret, and naturally these slave women would not be familiar with it. She sighed heavily before revealing the truth behind the order. To put it simply, your job will be to act as agents of espionage, sabotage, and assassination deep behind enemy lines. For the next few months, you will undergo the proper training to become a competent agent. From there, you will be dispatched to different regions and will be assigned different tasks. I won't lie to you. The veteran members of the Frumentarii will not be happy with women being employed in their ranks. Because of this, you will be assigned your own quarters during the duration of your training. After you have completed your training, you will be operating independently and because of that, you will not have to put up with the bullshit of the other agents, as you will answer directly to me. Are there any other questions? A Namidian woman by the name of Kahina was the next to raise her hand. She was unnerved by the idea of acting as an assassin and was quick to ask for clarification. You're saying we will have to kill people? Sigefrida gazed at the woman with a hint of pity in her eyes before nodding her head in agreement. That is correct. Kahina bit her lip in displeasure. Though she detested the idea of taking another living being's life, she ultimately persuaded herself into it. After all, killing others was better than living her life as a slave. The sheer abuse that a beauty like her had to go through at the hands of her Roman masters was unspeakable. 
she had been sold to a particularly sinister master and was only acquired by Seich Frida because the man was a conspirator who had been taken out by her fermentarii. Upon seeing that the woman had accepted her lot in life, Seich Frida sighed before trying to comfort her, she herself was suddenly thrust into a position where she was responsible for the lives of others. Something she was still adjusting to, thus she could empathize with the woman. I know it won't be easy, but sometimes there are wicked deeds that need to be undertaken in order for the empire to survive. By the time your training is over, you should be over the internal disgust that comes with the act. Kahina nodded her head. Though she lamented the idea of killing others, it was still necessary to gain her freedom. With her agreement, there were no other questions, and thus, Seige Frida sent the women off to their training. Afterward she was all alone, as Marcellus was currently being monopolized by Placidia, who had become increasingly hostile to her as the days passed. The two women used to have a good relationship when they had to deal with Aeliana. However, after the woman's death, their fragile alliance crumbled, and they became bitter rivals fighting for Marcellus' affection. Seige Frida bit her lip before deciding to covertly spy on the couple's actions. Currently Marcellus was caught by Placidia, who latched onto his arm with a warm smile on her pretty face. The two of them were testing a cake recipe that Marcellus had thought up of recently. In truth, this was just a preparation for the upcoming wedding that Marcellus had planned. Though Marcellus desired a traditional pagan wedding, it was still too early for him to publicly announce his hidden faith. The Nicene Church held significant influence over the Roman Empire, and it would not be easy to break away from such a stubborn faith so easily. As a result, Marcellus was forced to endure the Christian rites of marriage, which he personally found distasteful. To him, Christianity was a foreign Semitic religion which had replaced the gods of his ancestors. He looked down upon Constantine the Great for his edit of Milan, and even more so on Theodosius I for making it the official religion of the empire. Still, the marriage between him and Placidia needed to happen as soon as the girl turned of age, and because of this, he was planning months in advance. He did not have the time to wait to marry the girl until a time where he could restore the empire back to its religious roots. Interestingly enough, he had recently had another dream, from his past life as Frank. By now Marcellus had come to accept the possibility that these were likely not visions from the gods, but perhaps memories from another life. Truthfully, he did not care, as the more memories he had, the more he began to meld with his other identity. In preparation for this marriage, Marcellus had personally sought after a jeweler and requested a ring made of gold and emerald be manufactured. He had waited weeks for this accessory to be constructed, and now it was finally in his hands. He just needed to find the perfect moment to gift the ring to his fiancée. A tradition he had seen in his memories from his other life. Placidia and Marcellus were currently engorging themselves with cake while sitting on the balcony under the warm spring air. This was not an ancient Roman honey cake and was instead a new invention Marcellus had derived from that aforementioned dream. It was essentially a cannoli cake, but without the chocolate, instead it made use of almonds in their place. Placidia dined on the dish, with a wide smile on her face. She had never tasted a cake that was so delicious before. Marcellus saw this pleasant smile and decided now was the opportune moment to gift this woman with her engagement ring. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a small cloth which held the ring inside. He then unfurled the present to reveal the gift. The young woman did not expect Marcellus to be gifting her such expensive jewelry, but she had a wide smile on her face, as he placed the ring on the appropriate finger, or at least the one he remembered from his dream. He looked into the girl's eyes and smiled, forcing himself to say the romantic words he had thought up for this occasion. Placidia, this ring is a promise to you that I will make sure to take care of and love you until the day I die. You have always been a part of my family in my mind, and soon you will be my lawful wife. I just wanted to gift this to you, as a form of my appreciation for sticking by me until now. Even after what happened to your brother, you continue to prove your loyalty to me, and I appreciate that. Placidia was caught up in the moment, and stared at the beauty of the ring on her finger. 
Though she had heard what Marcellus had said, she was too enamored with the gift to properly respond. Upon seeing the girl was happy, Marcellus smiled. Though he still did not have any romantic interest in the girl, as she was too much like a sister to him, he still cared for Placidia and her happiness. If she would be happy by being with him, then he could endure the relationship, even if it meant that one day they would have to become physically intimate. Eventually Placidia snapped back to reality and hugged Marcellus tightly before saying the words in her heart. Thank you, I will treasure this ring from this day until my last. Marcellus could only stroke the girl's dyed blonde hair and nod his head. He stared into the distance as he did so to witness Sigefrida spying on them. Upon seeing this, he could only sigh in his heart. Marcellus knew that Sigefrida did not exactly enjoy seeing the man she loved with another woman, but there was nothing he could do about it. Placidia needed to become his wife, if not solely to secure his reign as legitimate. If only Sigefrida had been born the daughter of a wealthy patrician, perhaps then he would have married her. However, life was cruel, and nobody lived in their ideal world. Thus, he could only apologize to the woman later. He knew Sigefrida understood his actions, but the pain it caused her to see him act so romantically with Placidia obviously needed to be mended. Dot. Chapter 87 Inventing the Blast Furnace You are listening at NovelFull.audio Marcellus was in the middle of a bath. Days had passed since he had given Placidia her engagement ring, and he had mostly spent his time since then managing the nation's affairs. Assuring that the people of his realm placed the agricultural improvements that he had designed all over the borders of the Western Roman Empire. He had finally gotten some reprieve and had decided to wash the sweat and grime from his body. However, when he was in the middle of the bath, enjoying its warmth, he suddenly got a major headache. In that moment he felt as if his brain was being pierced by a million needles, causing him to reel back in agony as he suffered through the ordeal. He cursed that fact that he was alone in the palace's bath chamber, and because of this there was nobody to come to his rescue. Suddenly, he felt as if his mind was released from the torture as it entered into another world. While simultaneously gazing upon the scene of his bath, as if this vision was an augmented reality. He was both Frank and Marcellus at this moment while he watched the scene play out before him. Frank sat in the lecture hall for another one of his college history courses. It was his second year of college, and he was currently listening intently to his favorite professor as he discussed the ramifications of steelmaking in the late medieval period. The professor was a middle-aged man with a trimmed gray beard and short hair. The man wore a pair of glasses which had a strap on the back to prevent them from falling from his head. He had displayed a diagram on the board that showed exactly how a blast furnace functioned. He drawled on about the functions of such a critical piece of technology as many of his students fell asleep one by one. Though the man had a monotone voice, he presented the information in such a way that only Frank could find his lectures appealing. The girl seated next to him, for example, was drooling all over her laptop's keypad as the professor continued his lecture. What is a blast furnace? Well, to put it simply, it is a way to smelt crude iron into pig iron a form of iron that is high in carbon and thus useful for steel production. The technology could originally be found in China much earlier than in Europe, though by the 14th century the technology was widespread across Germany. To this day, we use this invention, albeit on a much grander scale, to manufacture pig iron, which ultimately goes into our steel production. A blast of furnace operates by dropping its fuel usually in the form of coke, with the metallic ores, and a flux, typically being limestone through the top of the furnace while a blast of hot air is supplied through the bottom via a series of tubes called tuyeres. As the materials fall downward, they are smelted into molten metal, with a byproduct of slag raising to the top of the material. As for the waste gases, they are expelled through the top of the structure. Frank listened to this information with an eager expression before everything went dark. After a while Marcellus came to and realized he was having difficulty breathing. During his vision, he had fallen under the surface of the water, causing him to be in his current state. Without a second thought, 
he quickly dragged himself out from its depths while hurling himself onto the edge of the bath as he spat out the water that had pooled up in his stomach. He did not know what had just happened to him. Usually these dreams occurred when he was asleep or suffered through some kind of head trauma. Yet, at this moment, he was clearly living two lives at once. Or at least the memory of another life was overlaying his current reality. Just what was going on with him. Whatever had occurred, he did not desire to stay in his bath any longer, and quickly climbed out of the pool before heading towards his quarters to dress in his armor. Having done so, he soon found himself in his room, drawing the vision from his dream, before he could forget its contents. Whatever this thing was, it must be important. Though he failed to understand many of the words that were spoken by the professor, it did not matter so long as he could replicate the diagram that was shown on the board. Before long, he had a working blueprint. Albeit it would require some work on the part of his smiths and engineers to fully be realized in this ancient world. Still, he had high hopes, as his visions had never failed him in the past. After concluding this blueprint, he hollered after Seich Frida, who soon arrived in his office. The woman was curious as to why her presence was requested, but not for long, as Marcellus quickly voiced his reasoning. What can you tell me about the situation in Gaul and Britannia? How are Ordius and Primus faring with the locals? Seige Frida walked over to one of Marcellus' cabinets and pulled out a large map, which she sprawled across his desk before addressing her point. From the information I have gathered, Ordius is facing stiff resistance from the Franks, who dwell in the northeastern part of the land. They are not giving up their lives in the borders of the empire so easily. It is my suggestion that we send some federati to the region to instill order and proceed with our punitive actions. Marcellus nodded his head in agreement before approving this suggestion. Indeed, more troops are needed to remove the Franks from the lands. If they desired to live in the borders of the empire, they shouldn't have backed Constantine in his claim. They must be removed. We shall send 10,000 Gothic federati to Gaul to aid Ordius in his efforts. If the Franks resist, they can be purged. Now what about Britannia? Seige Frida sighed as she pointed to Londinium on the map. She continued her explanation of what was transpiring in the region. Primus occupies Londinium with his forces, and has brought the Romano, British back under your control. However, the Picts have begun to descend from Hadrian's Wall and attack the northernmost regions. He has responded by sending 2,000 men to the region to keep the peace, but the Picts are too many. Not enough local men have been drafted into Primus' forces. On top of this, word spreads of a potential Saxon invasion on the horizon. Nobody knows if these rumors are true or not, but it would appear that Britannia will become a major battlefield soon. Without proper support, Primus will not be able to defend the land. Marcellus sighed when he heard this. If such a thing were the case, then he had more problems than the Franks in Gaul. He wondered if he should approach another barbarian tribe, and try to recruit them as federati. Seige Frida seemed to be of the same opinion as she voiced her idea on how to fortify Britannia aloud. The Swabi have broken through the Rhine and are ravaging Gaul. If they can be convinced to come to heal, we could make use of them. After all, my people are mighty warriors, though whether they can be trusted to fulfill their duties, that is another issue. Marcellus reflected on these words for some time. He had fought the Swabi in the past and killed two of their chieftains something their people would not easily forget. On top of this, his family had taken Seige Frida as a slave, and though she was released from her bondage and was now his concubine, that was something the Swaby would not exactly be fond of. The Swaby were a semi-nomadic people and were among the most fierce of Germania's tribes. However, it would not be easy to gain their loyalty, especially with such factors working against him. Seige Frida could tell Marcellus was hesitant about this path, and decided to reveal some information she had never told him. You may not be aware of this, but my father held a fearsome reputation among the Swabi. He was a renowned warrior who commanded his own war. Banned and had three wives where he fathered thirteen children among them. My mother was his third wife, and he had only had me with her before he died in battle. 
Intelligence from Gaul suggests that my oldest brother, Asarolfo, is uniting the Suebi in preparation for a migration to Hispania. If he can be convinced to align with Rome, he will make for a powerful ally. However, I don't even know if that is possible. He has a bitter hatred of the Empire, and everyone in it. It will not be an easy task. Marcellus thought about this for several minutes. He honestly did not know much about Seidfrida's family, aside from the fact that her mother and her were sold into slavery to his family when she was a young girl. He remembered the woman's mother and had fond memories of her. She had always looked after him as if he were her own child. Unfortunately, she passed away when they were teenagers due to illness. If he could gain the Swaby as an ally, perhaps he could also reconcile Seidfrida with her family. Because of this, he had decided on at least attempting to negotiate with the woman's brother as he nodded his head and expressed approval of this plan. Very well. I will meet with this Asarolfo personally. We will see if he and his people desire to aid in the rebuilding of Rome, or become a footnote in history. Seidfrida honestly didn't care one way or another. As far as she was concerned, Marcellus was her family. She did not even remember any of her half-dot siblings, or her father, for that matter. She would be surprised if they were even aware she existed. Thus, she had no intentions to follow Marcellus on his journey to Gaul, and aid in his negotiations. Chapter 88 Maintaining Order in Gaul You are listening at NovelFull.audio In the borders of Roman Gaul sat a village that was mostly inhabited by the families of the Frankish warriors who had perished in Hispania. These men and women were now in open rebellion against Marcellus' rule after besting Constantine and slaughtering his army in the Pyrenees. Ordius stood at the rear of his army. Marcellus had given him roughly 12,000 men to secure the region of Gaul and to use them as a means to remove the local Franks as punishment for their crimes. The Franks who had settled in Gaul, despite being Federati of Rome for decades, had sided with Constantine in his rebellion. In doing so, they had turned their backs on Rome. Marcellus was a man who would not let treason go unpunished, and as a result, he decided to expel the Franks who still dwelled within Roman borders. It just so happened that these Franks were unwilling to move back to Germania. After all, the other Germanic tribes were more powerful than they were. Should they return to their ancestral homeland, their peers would only bully them. As a result, an armed insurrection had taken place in Gaul. Something Marcellus had already anticipated. The Frankish villagers had taken up whatever arms they had buried in rebellion against Ordius, and the new military dictatorship that was imposed upon them. They gathered in their villages, and fortified them with wagons and felled logs as makeshift defenses. Currently, Ordius and the first of his two legions were standing off on the other side of these fortifications, raining arrows down upon the villagers. As for his other legion, they were deployed under a subordinate to quell another area of unrest. Ordius sighed as he saw the Franks fall to the wayside, as the raining arrows plunged into their bodies and skewered their organs. Such a pointless loss of life, or so he thought. It was evident that most of Frank's hardened warriors had died in Hispania. These men and women who currently took up arms were simple farmers. They were not the battle.Hardened veterans that the Franks were renowned for. Or at least those who were west of the Rhine. Few men wore armor, and most used poorly maintained shields and crude spears as their weapons. When compared to the ranks of the Roman legions, they were lacking in every way. At the front of these fortifications was a Roman battering ram, which was slowly bashing away at the wagons, pushing them aside so that the legionaries could break through and slaughter the enemy. Eventually, the wagons were smashed to pieces by the hardened iron battering ram, and the Roman legions flooded into the village like a tidal wave of red and silver, their iron scale armor glimmering under the light of the sun. Steel plunged through the flesh of the Frankish citizens and reaped their lives. Once the main defensive line had been broken, those poor souls who had rebelled quickly routed. But there was nowhere to go, as the rebels had blockaded themselves within their town. All they could do was a struggle until the bitter end. O.org The legions did not break formation, they were well trained, 
and raised their shields as they pressed through the city. Working together in unison like a well-oiled machine as they plunged their steel spada into the torsos of their enemies. One by one, the Franks fell to the Roman onslaught. This wasn't a battle, or even a rebellion, just another slaughter. Ordius could hardly gaze upon the gore, as the streets of the town flowed red with the blood of its inhabitants. Those who were of Gallo, Roman descent hid within their homes and boarded up their windows, doing nothing to come to the defense of their barbarian neighbors. Though Ordius didn't enjoy massacring villages, his orders were to bring the region of Gaul under his control, and as the military governor that was what he intended to do, no matter what the cost. By the time the sun set in the evening, the stench of blood and bile filled the streets. The Franks who had rebelled against Marcellus' authority lie dead, their bodies hewn across the town. There was no mercy for those who resisted the authority of the emperor. Ordius sifted through the blood-soaked streets with a downcast expression, gazing upon the corpse of a young blonde girl who clutched a stuffed doll to her chest. His heart bled as he witnessed the loss of such an innocent life. He wanted to condemn whatever man had put innocent children to the sword, but there way no way to find out that man's identity. Eventually, he found a group of his men surrounding a smaller group of women and girls. The women had been stripped naked, and were crying with tears as the legionaries were about to force themselves upon them. That is, until the voice of the military governor erupted in fury behind them. What is going on here? The centurion in charge of his unit gazed upon Ordius without the slightest sense of guilt or fear in his eyes. Instead, he wore a proud expression on his face as he held on to a girl as young as thirteen. Legatus. We were just taking advantage of the spoils before taking them as slaves. You know how it is. Ordius was displeased with this remark, and instantly unsheathed his blade and stuck it through the man's unarmored neck. The centurion gazed in shock as the life faded from his eyes. His soldiers were immediately frightened upon seeing this and took a few steps back. Ordius quickly gave a command to his troops as he scolded them. Get dressed, and keep yours hands off of the merchandise. Who gave you permission to claim the spoils as your own? Are you a filthy barbarian? We are Romans. And we have rules of conduct we must abide by. You do not get to do as you please to the defeated. Do I make myself clear? The soldiers all nodded their heads in approval as they heard this. They were too frightened to make a comment on what the legatus had said. After saying this, Ordius scowled before continuing his journey through the streets of the town. By now, the Gallo, Roman citizens had descended from their hiding spots and began to thank the Roman legionaries for their mercy. As for Ordius, he made sure that his legion acted with the strictest discipline. Though this slaughter could have been avoided had the Franks only done as they were told. He did not want any unnecessary cruelty to be inflicted upon them. Thus, while Marcellus was planning to meet with Sigefrida's eldest brother in an attempt to gain the Swaby as Federati, Ordius began to ensure that his troops did not behave like the barbarians they were sent to remove. He also ensured that an unnecessary slaughter like this would never happen under his command again. Many of these legionaries were drunk on power after their first victory, and now believed they could behave as they damn well pleased. They would soon learn under the lash of the legatus Gaius Licinius Ordius that this was not the case. This chapter is a preview, if you want to see a faster and more up dot to dot date chapter, please visit. For more content. Chapter 89 Meeting with the Swaby You are listening at NovelFull.audio Marcellus sat across from a Swaby warlord by the name of Acerolfo. This man was not only a Swaby chieftain who was gathering the clans into one giant army. He was also a veteran warrior of a hundred battles, and more importantly, Sigefrida's eldest brother. Sigefrida was in her late twenties, while this man was practically forty. Despite the age difference between him and Marcellus, Acerolfo had a regal appearance, one that the Roman emperor was not expecting. On one side was a Roman emperor garbed in purple, with gilded scale armor, on the other was the Swaby chieftain dressed in a green tunic with red embroidery, and a shirt of mail. 
Marcellus had spent weeks journeying from his capital of Ravenna to the borders of Gaul, where Asarolfo and his war dot band currently lie. After a brief scuffle between Marcellus' messengers and the warriors of the Swaby tribe, the two men had decided to meet outside the city of Lugdunum. A safe enough distance away from Roman forces that the Swaby would not feel threatened, while still close enough to the city for Marcellus to feel secure. The two men did not speak for many moments. Instead, they sized one another up, determining the value of each other's character by sheer virtue of appearance. Though Marcellus' armor was gilded, there were serious signs of wear on it. It was clear that until recently, the Roman emperor was a man who fought on the front lines. Something that surprised Asarolfo as it was against Roman doctrine. The calluses on Marcellus' hands suggested he was well accustomed to menial labor, as well as wielding a sword. Another aspect of Marcellus' character that Asarolfo found interesting. Whereas Marcellus judged the man seated across from him by how well he groomed himself. He was a barbarian, but his platinum hair was perfectly brushed, to ensure there was not the slightest sign of matting. His beard was gently oiled and combed to avoid a frazzled appearance. Even though he was finely groomed, Asarolfo was purely martial in appearance. There was no superfluous gilding of his armor or helmet, even though he could easily afford it. A testament to his affinity for practicality was on full display with his spathas hilt, which had a simple construction. Despite the fact that the Germanic chieftains and kings were well known for overly embellishing the hilts of their swords. After approving of each other's appearance, Asarolfo was the first to break the silence. With a wry smile on his face, he uttered the words that Marcellus was not expecting. So my sister's slaver comes before me, begging for my servitude. Do you think that just because you have enslaved Sigefrida that I will be so quick to call you Dominus? It is a pity what happened to that girl and her mother, but she was better off with it. She has clearly proven she is not fit to wear the title of a swaby woman. These comments outraged Marcellus, but he kept a stoic appearance. It was one thing to insult him by calling him a mere slaver, but to insult the woman he loved, that was enough to stoke any man's fury. Marcellus merely sighed in response as he ignored the man's provocation and spoke about more important matters. I know all about your plans to unite the Swaby clans and invade Hispania where you intend to carve out your own kingdom. I regret to inform you, but Hispania swears its loyalty to me, and there is no land there that is available for conquest. You are already intruding into my lands, the fact that we are meeting face to face is a testament of my benevolence, as well as my love for your sister, Asarolfo cocked a brow when he heard this last remark. He did not expect this Roman dog to speak of love for his sister, while he had heard that some Roman masters fell in love with their slaves. It was not the most common occurrence. Rather, there were far more tales of abuse toward slaves within the borders of the empire. He was quick to call Marcellus out on this point of his argument, rather than speak of his plans of invasion. Are you saying you love my sister? Oh, that is fascinating. So the bitch has used her wiles to snare herself an emperor. Truly, my father would be dumbfounded if he were alive to hear this. I have heard rumors of your empire. Your rule is not like your predecessors, and there are those in your empire who are against your reign. How long do you think you can last as in your position with traitors around every corner seeking to overthrow you? Marcellus scoffed when he heard this. It was true that there were plenty within his borders who sought to eliminate him. There were even more who still called himself a usurper, and did not recognize his reign as legitimate. It had been less than a year since he had come to the throne. He was well aware of the dangers around him, yet he was undeterred. Instead, he took a sip from his chalice before calmly answering the question. I say I have a good five years before I'm assassinated, most likely by one of my closest advisors. The history of Rome proves that the most capable emperors tend to die young, Asarolfo was baffled when he heard Marcellus answer. The man knew he was likely to be assassinated, and even estimated that he had five years before it happened. So why did he take up the position of emperor if he knew it would cause his untimely death? He could not help but ask this question. So then why? 
Marcellus gazed at Acerolfo with confusion as he heard this comment and quickly asked for clarification. Why what? It was clear to Acerolfo that the Roman emperor did not understand his intention behind such a simple question, thus he cleared his throat before asking the question in its entirety. Why did you seize the throne for yourself? You come from a position of wealth and privilege, do you not? Why not just retire to the countryside and live out the rest of your days in prosperity and security? Why bother entangling yourself with the dirty politics that have seen better men than yourself cast to the depths of oblivion? Marcellus did not even need a moment to think about the answer. He stared boldly at the man seated across from him before proclaiming his reasoning for getting involved in such dangerous affairs. Because someone has to do it. Rome will not survive so long as indolent fools and greedy bureaucrats continue to drive it off a cliff. The last time the empire had any hope of restoring itself to its former glory, the emperor was assassinated by his own praetorian guard, who took up the sword and betrayed their master simply because they feared they would be punished. Since then we have been spiraling towards collapse. Initially, I had only desired to serve in the army, and do my best to drive the barbarians from our lands. However, things don't always go as planned. A petty and indolent fool of an emperor deprived me of my position, kidnapped my mother, and called for my head. I took up the sword in the name of retribution and put an end to his reign. Since there was nobody in the empire better suited to ruling over it, naturally the burden fell on me. I may not be the greatest man for the job, but I'm the best one available. If I don't do my part, and lead by example, how can I expect anyone else to work for a better future? I am the Western Roman Empire simply because there is nobody better suited for the task. Should a man the likes of Aurelian arise from my ranks, and desire to take the reins, I will gladly hand him my diadem, and retire to the countryside with your sister where we can live a peaceful and prosperous life. Unfortunately, nobody like that exists, or at least not at the moment. Since there is nobody who wishes to do the dirty work that is necessary to restore the empire, I will do it. Bedo them this line of thinking astounded Acerolfo, who gazed at Marcellus as if he was looking at a madman, who would do so much work, and risk their life for the save of preserving a rotten empire. He could not fathom the mindset. The Swaby chieftain could only scratch his head as he thought through it. He came back to the same question he had earlier and voiced it in hopes of clarification. Even if you are the most capable man for the job, why would you do it? Knowing full well the risks involved, and the stress that comes with it. Why would you do that to yourself? Marcellus took another sip of his wine within his chalice before responding in earnest to the man's question. Because there was a time where Rome was once the beacon of all civilization, its greatness was beyond measure, and I believe that one day we can reclaim that glory. I doubt I am the man to lead us to such greatness, but at the very least, I can prevent the empire's collapse until a time where that man comes to power. Acerolfo stared at Marcellus with a dumbfounded expression on his face. Though such words were not enough to move him to serve beneath the boot of Rome, he had a newly founded respect for Marcellus and could only utter his thoughts. Well said, the negotiations between Marcellus and Acerolfo would continue for some time before any form of agreement could be made, but Marcellus had started strong in his negotiations. Chapter 90 Assassinating a Rival General You are listening at NovelFull.audio While Marcellus was in Gaul negotiating with the Swabi to obtain their allegiance. His fermentarii were in the middle of a clandestine operation deep behind enemy lines. In the slaver's market of Constantinople there was a particularly beautiful Numidian woman who was topless, with only a loincloth and a collar to call clothes. A Western Roman merchant from the Diocese of Afriki stood in front of her, and a group of other slaves as he boldly proclaimed the value of his latest goods to the wealthy patricians of the Eastern Roman capital. Currently, the merchant was hawking his goods and attracting his customers with one particular target in sight. Aulus Pontidius Phrygi was the current Magister Militum of the Eastern Roman Empire. This meant he was the supreme commander of the Eastern Roman Army. He held significant strategic importance to the Eastern Roman Empire. Unknowingly to him and his masters, he had been marked for death by the Western Roman fermentarii. 
The reason behind this was simple retaliation. The Roman general was currently walking through the slave markets on his way to the royal palace while flanked by his guard when he was approached by the North African merchant. The slaver had a shameless smile on his face as he hawked his goods to what was obviously the man with the most visible wealth on display. After all, Phrygi's armor was extensively gilded, while his tunic was made of purple silk, imported from the Far East. Sir, you seem like a man of refined taste. Might I suggest to you this Namidian beauty that I have recently obtained from the Diocese of Afriki? I can assure you that not only is she a beauty of the highest quality, but her virtue is still intact, making her a unique commodity here in Constantinople. I'll tell you what, since you are clearly a man of such high standing, I will give you a discount, only ten solidii and you can call this beauty your own. If you're not into that kind of thing, you can always take her as a domestic slave, as she is well versed in the art of cooking, cleaning, and caring for little young ones. What do you say? I assure you, if you do not jump at this offer now, someone else will. In truth, the slaver had already received several offers to buy the woman throughout the day, but there was only one man he was interested in selling her to. Obviously, nobody knew this, and he simply said it was a matter of the price being wrong when he denied their requests. The man's arrogance visibly irritated Phrygi. Who did this fool think he was? How dare he approach the Magister Militum in the middle of the street as if they were long-time friends? However, when Phrygi gazed upon the naked bust of Kahina, it was as if he had fallen in love at first sight. This woman was definitely the general's type. She had long jet black hair, dark brown eyes, a curvy body, and dark tan skin that, when oiled, would drive any man insane with lust. He had struggled to swallow the saliva that had pooled up in his mouth as he gazed at the exotic beauty, who had a pouting expression on her pretty face. In his eyes, this expression only made the woman more attractive, and thus he quickly handed out a coin pouch without even thinking of the consequences. There was easily over fifty solidii in this pouch, but that did not matter to Phrygi, who just wanted a taste of the slave girl in front of him. Here, take it, you damned vulture. Now get the hell out of my face. The merchant forced himself to remain calm after being insulted during his transaction and wore a false smile as he nodded his head before bowing towards the Eastern Roman general. A wise man, I am sure you will enjoy her service, there was a hidden venom in the words he spoke, which went unnoticed by Phrygi and his men. The slaver quickly whistled, and the collared Numidian woman quickly stepped forward, where she was handed off to the Eastern Roman general. The woman continued to pout as her new master greeted her. Hello my darling, my name is Aulus Pontidius Phrygi. What is yours? Kahina looked to the side, unwilling to meet the gaze of a such a lecherous old man as she muttered a false identity beneath her breath. Dihia, the elderly Roman man smiled as he nodded his head and repeated the name. Dihia, that's a pretty name. From this day forward, I am your dominus. Come with me girl, I look forward to breaking you in, Kahina rolled her eyes when she heard this, which again went unnoticed by the Eastern Roman general and his guards. She looked off towards the slaver, who wore a sinister grin as the two of them silently nodded to one another. After this exchange of glances was made, Phrygi dragged Kahina off to his personal villa within the city's limits. Though the regent had summoned the Magister Milium for some urgent matter regarding his rivals in the east, he could pound sand. Phrygi had acquired himself a new toy, and he would be damned if he was forced to listen to that old bastard's words, instead of getting his dick wet. Phrygi led Kahina to his home, where he wasted no time. He commanded his soldiers to keep watch outside his room as he forced the girl into his bedchamber. The man was not kind, and immediately shoved Kahina onto the bed, where he impatiently tore at her loincloth, desperate to see the prize he had paid such a high price for. Unbeknownst to the eastern general, there was a small knife that was strapped to the woman's upper thigh, concealed by this loincloth. Thus, the moment he tried to remove it, Kahina pulled the blade from its sheath and buried it straight into the man's neck. The three-dot-inch iron blade immediately pierced through the man's carotid artery, causing his blood to rush out of the wound like a fountain. Before he could scream for help, 
the slave he had just purchased and intended to abuse had covered his mouth with her soft and dainty hands. She wore a devilish grin on her pretty face as she whispered the following words to the man while he slowly bleed out on his bed. Titus Claudius Marcellus sends his regards. These were the last words that Aulus Points Phrygi heard before the reaper claimed his soul. The man's death was so sudden and silent that nobody would ever expect it. However, Kahina had no time to relax. She had at most half an hour before the guards came knocking to retrieve him for his meeting with the Empress Regent. Thus, she immediately cleaned the man's blood off of her pristine body before pulling the sheets from the bed and tying them into a makeshift rope, where she tossed them out the window. Without the slightest sound, the woman climbed out of the window and absconded from the vicinity of the villa. The guards who were tasked to protect the Magister Militum were not any the wiser, as they had not believed anyone would dare attack the man in his own home. After killing the Eastern Roman general, Kahina skillfully made her way back to her partner in crime, who was the slaver that had sold her to Phrygi to begin with. This dynamic duo were members of the Frumentarii, and had just engaged in an act of retaliation as a response to the Eastern Roman Empire's previous attack on Marcellus' life. They would quickly flee the city and head back to Ravenna to await their further orders. By the time Yazdegerd and his agents learned of Phrygi's demise, they were already long gone. 